Back in October, I made a video about the Testudo formation of Total War. It was a video to document how the Testudo has been fundamentally changing from game to game. The changes are not good, and there's been a pretty clear downward trajectory of the Testudo gameplay as a result of these changes. So the purpose of that video was to establish this gameplay decay, quickly examine each Testudo implementation over 20 years of Total War, and then explain how the degradation of the Testudo and its gameplay clearly follows from the new systems that are being used, and establish that these kinds of gameplay elements will always suffer like this when they're handled in these kinds of ways. I examined in detail many things over the course of that 80 minute video, from the hit point system that emerged with Rome 2 and persists to this day, to the increasingly flimsy ways that benefits from the formation are bestowed upon the units. Although when you do hit the testudo button, your armour jumps up instantly, which is the only thing that matters. To the inadequacies of AI responses to these formations, to the way the formation adapts badly, or not at all, to changes in its shape, like with the one man thick testudo, to how the formation reacts or doesn't react to casualties and disruption, and how the formation handles the movement, or doesn't handle it. The video was 80 minutes long and has Testudo in the title. It has a title like this, so in addition to its primary purpose of analysis, it was also really good at flushing out dishonesty and showing up people that only read video titles, or that can't keep up with gameplay conversations worth a fuck. So I'm really glad I titled it like that, as you can imagine, but for this one, the title will be a bit more direct, more encompassing. I picked the Testudo for that last video because it was iconic, the perfect place to check for a pulse. We didn't find one, so it's time to do another one of these videos where I pick another persistent aspect of these games, examine how it works in modern games, compare it to how it used to work, and explain how I think it's gotten worse. And this time I'll do it with even more focus on gameplay consequences and have even more comparisons with other games than ever. I'll probably keep doing this over and over and over again so long as I still see comments like these and so long as they continue to look worse and worse as time goes on. There's also the people out there that just get it, and I'll always be doing this stuff for all of you, first and foremost. One of the most overlooked and forgotten aspects of Shogun 2 is the wedge ability for cavalry. This is a true formation ability, even more true than the original wedge ability in Shogun 1, because that one apparently involved some hidden buffs, so the physical formation was at least somewhat intruded upon by spreadsheet or spreadsheet gameplay. Even infantry could wedge in Shogun 1. It made some sense that Shogun 1 handled it like this, because that game wasn't even fully 3D, and there was no real physics of mass and space. It wasn't a complex simulation with momentum and pushing and deep formations. Rome Total War introduced that in 2004, with the jump to 3D. Its successor Shogun 2 absolutely is in full 3D though, and Shogun 2's wedge ability is for cavalry only. It forms those cavalry units into a point. It looks like it's a pure formation, because the physical restructuring of the unit is the only apparent consequence of the button. It's then up to the player to take this differentiating property and find ways to utilise it during gameplay. The game doesn't hold your hand and tell you what to do with it. The game doesn't really hold your hand and tell you how to do much of anything. This is why so many players have a light bulb moment when they first see the power of the Yarrow Wall and then go on and on about it. Discovering Yarrow Wall is the very start of competency in Shogun 2. A lot of people have their first good fight on the back of it. Like most other abilities or units in the game, you can completely forget about or ignore it, and that's what most players do with Wedge. Most people don't ever click it, or they try it one time and don't see clear results and don't feel impressed, and then write it off. Even most competitive gameplay oriented players often just forget that it's there. This is a good thing, and also a bad thing. It's good because it means the game is a sandbox that gives you tools and it's up to you to pick them up and use them well. You're permitted the most underrated freedom in gaming, the freedom to forget. It's up to you to remember this exists, to expend effort to experiment with it and find ways to use it and create your own success with it. 
It's not like in Three Kingdoms, where your cavalry are impotent without Wedge, and where you quickly notice that Wedge is indispensable. You can play that whole game by just spamming Wedge. If you play 3k without wedging at all, you'll have poor results and quickly start to wonder what you're doing wrong. You'll then figure out that there's a magic button you needed to click, and now every time before you charge, you click the magic button, and now, a flashy thing appears above your unit, the numbers all go up in the unit cards, and now your unit transmutes into titanium and steamrolls over everything. It doesn't even matter if the unit is in the shape of the wedge when it hits the enemy line, that doesn't matter at all. The actual wedge shape is very clearly irrelevant, it's just aesthetic. In fact, I'm sure my best ever charges in 3k were the ones where I've already got a fragmented charge happening across a wide frontage, and then I click wedge, and then I get the wedge bonuses without the unit ever remotely resembling a wedge at any point. In fact, let's test that. We're hitting them as a regular formation. They are bracing, it seems like they're trying to... They just tried to throw caltrops. So we've killed about 30 on the charge. Wedge. So it shapes into a point. And then you see all the numbers jumping up. And it just plows through. Kills about 40 or 50, yeah. And then watch this, I'm gonna do something that should be funny. Alright, it takes three seconds to get into Wedge, right? So watch this. Watch this. One, two, three. And I got the wedge bonus! And I've killed how many? How many have I killed? I've killed about 50 on the charge. So, I hit them as a wedge, and look at that, my kills are up to 70, 80, 70 kills. So I got 70 kills there with that charge. With the full bonus from wedge. I had the full wedge bonus in that charge, I saw the numbers going up, I had the extra charge, I had the extra mass. See all this stuff here? Let's have a look. All this stuff, I got it all, and now I'm going to take it away. Yeah, it's gone. So now I've got the armor back, I've got the speed back, but I just hit this unit with a potent charge right across the front of it. And I had all of these bonuses, 100% mass, 50% charge, 25% melee charge bonus. I got all of it for free without the actual wedge shape. I didn't remotely resemble a wedge there when I impacted that unit. I didn't resemble a wedge at any point there. But because I clicked this button, I got the good charge of a wedge charge. Because that's what the button does, It just it's a magic button that gives you bonuses. <laughs> they aren't secondary to the effect of the formation in combat. So it should be very clear at this point that you click wedge to make the numbers go up. Those numbers are the whole point, if you'll pardon the pun. This is very, very bad. My entire Sao Sao campaign, which ended because patching for the game has never been safe friendly, revolved entirely around cavalry and wedge. Cavalry already being overpowered, and then Wedge giving them numbers that make everything else secondary. Patches only recently started to ameliorate this situation, nearly two years after launch. So in the case of the Three Kingdoms Wedge, it's not really Wedge, and it's not really a Wedge button. It's a supercharge. It's a supercharge button. It's a supercharge that happens when you click the supercharge button. It shouldn't be called Wedge. And you shouldn't have to click it either. A script to make the most of this system would be so simple. As soon as you're charging, activate the supercharge. As soon as you're in the melee, deactivate the supercharge. Clicking this button is entirely perfunctory, and this system leaves almost no room for actual thought or gameplay. This is pure APM burden. The numbers are everything, and you either have them for the few seconds where it matters, or you don't. As I said of the poorly implemented juggernaut in my player freedom video, how are you supposed to push a system like this? This is not remotely interesting. It's a goddamn snorefest. And in a game like 3k where cavalry is everything and this is how you make the most of them, it means that the most effective gameplay will always be boring as fuck. 
it actually damages the cavalry gameplay because there's way less incentive to think about positioning and movement and manoeuvring and baiting and feinting about what has emerged over the years as the actual cavalry tactics. When the supercharged button is in play, it takes precedence over everything else, its obscene power being unlocked with pure dumb attention. All other tactical considerations are secondary to this, they're dwarfed by these numbers and their significance. Make a cavalry blob, wedge the whole thing, charge at the nearest viable target, pull through to the next target, rinse and repeat. I should point out that they actually somewhat fixed this recently with patch 1.7 because now cavalry take time to build up a charge. You can no longer just click nearby units while in a static melee for an instant stop start explosive charge. Two years later, finally. You might have noticed by this point that this whole situation with Total War's wedge progression is almost exactly the same as that of the Testudo, where the formation itself is very obviously irrelevant because what's actually happening is a button is making crucial numbers go up and down, and it's the numbers that do all of the work. A magic button, magic numbers. You click Testudo, you're completely immune to arrows. You click Testudo again, you're completely exposed. You click wedge, you roll over everything. You click wedge again, you've got your speed back. I went nearly 5 years without ever talking about Total War, but when I resumed in 2019, here's what I said within 10 minutes. Getting out of wedge, because wedge slows us down. And it reduces our armor and stuff as well, it's weird. I'm not sure how I like these abilities and formations and stuff. I don't think that's how it should be implemented, like... Why would... Going into a formation, increase our mass. That's not how it works. It's kind of like with the formations for infantry, like range block chance. If you go into a, into a shield wall, just because what well, it adds a number on, it should be. I don't like these numbers that are just being added on as multipliers. It should be something that physically happens and gets modeled in the game. Like they should actually raise their shields up, and that should be from where the block chance is derived. It shouldn't just be a fucking number when you toggle on ability. Suppose we can't model that shit yet in Total War games, oh well. So suffice to say, I noticed this immediately and it was worrying me from the very start. Shogun 2 didn't have a supercharge button, it had a wedge button that created a wedge. You'd click wedge and a horse would take the lead. The rest of the unit would form into a wedge behind it, an actual wedge. The unit would move in a wedge and would hit enemy lines like a wedge would. It would slam into the middle, killing most of what's there, splitting the unit in half, and then the wedge could run straight through and out the other side. In Shogun 2, the wedge button was like the wedge of the original Shogun. The unit forms a pointed penetrating tip. You click it for the first time and watch the wedge assemble, and now your first thought should be, how can I use this during gameplay? If that's what happens, then you're actually playing the game and you're actually engaging with the systems. If you can think of a way to use this differentiating property, then you're engaging in a kind of gameplay that's more than just accumulating numbers, which, as I've explained in my video on unit diversity, playing to make numbers go up isn't tactics, it's actually the worst kind of gameplay there is. It's a compulsion loop that's inherently devoid of virtue or vigorous thought. This is the kind of attitude to games that has people wanting to go into deeper dungeons to get better gear so they can go into deeper dungeons to get better gear, while the gameplay itself never changes. It's lazy developers using lazy game design to make lazy games for lazy players that just want a fast dopamine drip. The numbers on your armour goes up while your time and money disappears. You might have noticed I'm now alluding to my unit diversity video and the spreadsheet gameplay that video describes. I made that illusion because this stuff is all interconnected. It all comes together and it all intersects to create the shit show that is modern Total War gameplay. I've got to keep cross-referencing because there's so much. So what's the wedge actually for in Shogun 2? What's its emergent purpose? because there isn't any prescribed one, that's something worth looking at. If Shogun 2 did it properly, what was the end result of this success? Historically, the wedge was to allow a cavalry group to follow the leader, so the entire force always knows exactly what to do, like a flight of cranes. That's how it was used by Alexander and his companions. In combat, 
it was for creating and exploiting opportunities, force multipliers. The principle is used by Riot Police and in sport today. They actually banned it in rugby for being overpowered. Op. But Total War is just a game. Maybe the simulation still isn't robust enough to have the same consequences emerge from equivalent in-game scenarios. Maybe that's why they give up across the board and relegate unit differentiation and usage into being spreadsheet exercises instead of actual mechanics and systems. Or maybe it's not a shortcoming of the design direction. Maybe it's the fault of the players, because after all, what's the point in implementing features if almost nobody even tries to use them? Maybe people really do need to have a complete facade of gameplay because they just won't engage in any of their own. Maybe the benefit of Wedge needs to be more proximate and obvious, so obvious that it can be represented by green and red numbers on a tooltip, or, more likely, maybe its implementation just isn't ambitious enough. Rome 2 broke sales records, and it did it with marketing based on promises of a deeper, expanded, scoped, more gritty and more realistic game. Um, multiple ships per unit, which actually, which really adds to the sense of scale. Um, and here's the Roman fleet approaching the beach. So this, this really showcases a new battle type, which is a combined battle. Um, so you've got naval forces and land forces in the same battlefield. But not only that, you see um, the men on the ship disembark to fight on land. And so here they're approaching the, approaching the beach and they're going to disembark to join the, join the siege. And the c combined battles really add a, a load of gameplay in terms of, you know, cat and mouse around the coast and the defense of, um, of the beach versus the defense of the city. And we're really experimenting with different ways to make that gameplay work really, really well. So here you see the men, the guys disembarking onto the beach. This is, you know, what we're trying to achieve here is get a real sense of almost a saving private Ryan of the ancient world. <laughs> We really want to get get the camera down, get that sense of uh, darker that that darker vision of war, where you really make the, this human scale of, of, of battle um, come alive, and, and and it's it's part of that darker vision of war, a more gritty, realistic feel to the to the way the battles work. <laughs> So this is an example of um, a unit camera, and we're really experimenting with, with ways to get the player um, down into the action. Prepare for battle, men. Remember, we fight for Rome! Stand out of your weapons. Keep those actions clear. We'll see you on the beach. It's part of humanizing the the combat and really bringing out the the idea that these these thousands and thousands of men, each one is an individual fighting his guts out. And so we've got things like facial animations, emotional interactions between men. Yeah, the goldfish mouse <laughs> movements are still there. <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> it really helps. Um, bring out that, that, that sense of, of warfare at the human scale as well as the grand scale. Completely and utterly empty promises with an immediate apology to boot, but promises nonetheless. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure this guy right here is going to be able to fire. Alright, yeah. let's see. Okay, the, let's see the one. <laughs> yeah, they're all firing. <laughs> Oh, they are? Yeah. <laughs> As I predicted. <laughs> if it's the case that the ability on its own isn't enough, maybe they could improve the morale system to reasonably accommodate for what happens when a unit is fractured, when it's had a wedge driven into it, splintering it into two parts, and it's lost all cohesion. This is what the Shogun 2 wedge reliably does. Drives a wedge, it splits the unit, the 3k wedge doesn't. The 3k wedge is just a clusterfuck. Meanwhile, driving a wedge and splitting units is what the artillery and warhammer seems to always be trying to do. 
it just shoots at the center of the formation at the exclusion of all else. Marginally better than previous Total War games where they always aimed at the very end of the line I suppose. Ironically, that's something the Wedge of Total War could use, shaving the end of units with drive-bys. And ironically again, the artillery of Warhammer wedges better than the Wedge of Three Kingdoms. It's all just backwards. Anyway, it's not up to me to have an answer to how Wedge should be advantageous in-game. This is the job of the game designers at CA, to produce a good simulation, a simulation with robust systems that permit Wedge to serve a real purpose in their midst, to encourage the player to always be aware of Wedge and to always be ready to use it when there's a good opportunity, to implement strong systems that permit tactically minded players to find emergent uses that reward their creativity and their resourcefulness. To give an example of a game where you're given a system with no prescribed usage and where it's entirely up to you to conceive your own gameplay, I'll go with the best example I know of this. I'll once again appeal to Dishonored and it's Blink. Blink is a targeted instantaneous teleport ability. I'll show it in action with a 2 minute video I made that makes heavy use of it. And while the video is playing, I'll describe the purpose of every single blink usage inside that two minutes to show how applicable a simple teleport ability can be inside of a well-made simulation. Alright, here we go. Closing the distance to get the element of surprise in the melee. Alright, this goes fast so we'll try and keep up. Blinking to dodge the projectile. Blinking to dodge again and get up high. Then actually get on top for the drop assassination. So that's pure, purely movement, offensive aggressive movement then blinking up here to get out of the fight and then be ready for another drop attack. And this is a bit of a lull now. But already that's several different usages. And then while both of these are facing this way, you blink behind. And that's perfect setup for the melee the executions. And then blink while jumping for extra height to get up really high. And we're at the top of the map. And then I deal with these guards. Using bend time. Boom. And then blink behind while the swipe's coming in. So the swipe is evaded and you get behind to strike. And then blink out the window and then blink to break the fall. That one's quite remarkable. And then you blink to get vertical height to get the drop assassination, which is something you can't usually pull off. And then blink in behind these to get the melee and then the slow-mo cinematic part, the highlight of the video. And then... Blinking to dodge a bullet, he was dialed in and he was ready to pull the trigger and I heard the gun cock and I blinked behind him and then this is a bit of a downtime. So already we've had offensive and defensive blinks and a lot of blinks to, to move outside of combat. Blinked off the chain, blinked behind again just before he noticed. And then the bloodthirsty combo. That's quite brutal. And then blinking while jumping to get a lot of distance and into the water. So this is a well implemented teleport ability and I'm pretty sure the developers didn't even anticipate that players would use it in combat situations with full presence of mind but here it is, being incorporated into combat sequences where it's interweaved and interacting with almost every system in the game during open combat. These are all emergent and novel usages permitted by a robust implementation and by a player actively engaging with it. Then, if you want to see the complete opposite when it comes to a system designed for player mobility, here's the rope arrow from Thief in 2014. You can't use rope arrows as well on any wooden surface like in previous Thief games. Instead, you're left with this, this little fucking plank thing. I don't even know what that is, but you can only fire rope arrows on these little planks. So, yeah, you, you kind of, like, that's another thing that's really bad. That's why, I, that's why I said that it's almost as if they went out of their way to make this as linear as possible. It's, it's a fucking joke. There are predetermined latch points, and the gameplay is entirely preconceived and perfunctory. You're basically watching a cutscene every time you use this. There's no real engagement or thought or meaningful action. It's preconceived and you're on rails every time you do this. It's a parody of the original. 
and here's how it worked in Thief 2 in 2000, 14 years earlier. Yeah, I set off an alarm or something and everything just came after me. Maybe we'll escape using rope arrows if I do it cunningly. I wouldn't have even went to the entrance in the first place, man. I don't know where I was, I just was going somewhere. You identify a surface that's made of wood, which is a common material. You fire a rope arrow. The rope is released out in a robust way. You climb the rope. The climbing itself is a real system that can happen on any rope in any place and at any time. If you're in a room, okay, if you're in a room in a game like Thief and you can't jump on a fucking box that's about about the height of your waist, about waist level, then that's just... What are you doing, like, when you make a game and you put that in it? What the fuck are you doing? How do I... See, look, I can't... Like, I can't get on this bed, I can't jump on it, it's just... Uh, I think I messed around too long. Okay, shit, go, 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 go. What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. So what we've got here is a dumbed down, consolized bastardization of what was once a proud and awesome stealth franchise, where the player has the freedom to explore the yeah. nice little line, the nice little line that the developers drew, drew for them. You know, we, yeah, we can, we'll go down the line, you know, I've, I've just had it with this fucking game, I'm never playing it again. Unlike the Thief 2014 system, the player is rewarded for being curious and resourceful and keeping the rope arrow in mind, which is what a master thief would be. You're in the mind of the thief by playing like this and by engaging with these systems that you're given. In the Thief reboot of 2014, you're one step away from watching a shitty cutscene every time you use a rope arrow, in which case, what the fuck is the point of the rope arrow? If the gameplay around it is garbage and pointless, if it's so non-existent that the whole thing is like a thinly veiled loading screen, then why not just have a loading screen? I actually stopped playing this game after 9 minutes and requested a refund from Steam when I noticed this. Likewise with 3K, if the wedge ability isn't even a wedge and it's just a bullshit magic button, why even bother? We can't even hotkey it to take the misery out of having to click it all the time. The game doesn't even have hotkey support for abilities. I've heard Warhammer is the same. Fucking what? No hotkeys for essential abilities in AAA games in 2021? Nobody's gonna care about these disposable annualised games for long enough to try to play them effectively and memorise the hoggies. Anyway, so who cares? Is that what's going on? Compare that with Shogun 2, where you can hotkey wedge and where it's a real formation with real utility. You play as the Takeda and arrange your cavalry onto wedges, you fire them into weakened enemy infantry lines to begin routes, you send your light cavalry head on into the strongest enemy cavalry units, which wraps itself around your wedge, exposing massive surface area, you slam into the exposed ends and annihilate the unit, or you open fire on the enveloping unit with matchlocks, you might have even done all of this deliberately, you might even have deliberately used tactics, and the game might even have been robust and consistent enough with its simulation to actually let you do it on purpose. Imagine if that was the case. Imagine what a feeling that would be. To feel like a tactician. To feel like a general. Or here's Wedge being used on multiplayer to pierce through lines with its narrow frontage. To wreak havoc at a weak point in the line. To get behind the opponent by going through him breaking a section of the opponent's line and terrifying every unit that continues to fight because they've been outflanked. I wedge right through his infantry and then just kept pushing and pushing and when you're when his flag starts flashing like that you just go through and they'll rout instantly. They'll it'll, they'll destroy everything. So we should hit them right in the middle in a wedge and break the unit in half. Let's see if it happens. Nah, it's just a blob all the way along. There's not even any increase in horses in the middle. It's just a... They just slap right onto the side of the unit. They just impact all the way across the front of the unit. And we only got about 15 kills there because we're braced. So this doesn't resemble a wedge at all. And here we are in Shogun 1. 
where gunners have firing drills. You don't even need to tell them to do it. No babysitting required, no bullshit magic buttons, they just do what's best. They make the most of whatever frontage you give them with the placement you decide on, because the importance of line of sight and maximising firepower at all times is designed into the unit behaviour. They counter march and kneel fire automatically, depending on how they're placed. Every man reloads when he can, and there's a coordinated salvo behaviour. You consider for the physical dimensions of the unit and you consider for line of sight. There's even weather that might stop them from working at all. Wow, so much to consider. So much to use. And this was their first try. They designed this in 1999. And now, you have guns that don't even reload and don't even shoot bullets, that don't even behave like guns. Guns that are mechanically bankrupt, glorified archers, I'm going back to my flaccidification of ranged combat video now, and to my immolation of player freedom video now. See once again how all of this is connected. To give another example of this kind of a disconnect, in Homeworld 1, you had a robust simulation of ships and their projectiles. There was mass and speed and momentum. It was summarised well here in this video by Bob Emilius. Homeworld is a space-based RTS game originally released in 1999 by Relic Entertainment. The same guys who would go on to make some other excellent games like Company of Heroes and Dawn of War. Homeworld broke new ground by introducing movement in a 3D plane, and by having what is arguably the best tactical space battle gameplay available in any RTS then or now. In an RTS environment that was dominated by games like StarCraft and RTSs with generic rock-paper-scissors unit balancing, Homeworld shined by physically simulating units and weapons in space so that they were balanced against each other in what you might consider more natural or realistic way. A uh, bomber is good against a big, slow-moving frigate because it has a high damage weapon system, but it's bad against an interceptor because said weapon physically moves very slowly through space and is unlikely to hit a fast-moving target. It's not bad against the Interceptor, because the game arbitrarily says a bomber has a 10% chance of hitting an Interceptor. Because Homeworld uses physics instead of RNG, we can take a unit's movement into account when firing a weapon at it in a much more realistic way. If the Interceptor is sitting still, or moving slowly and not taking evasive action, there's a good chance it's going to get hit by that bomber's slow-moving anti-capital projectile and take extreme damage. And now here's the simulation in action. Just look at these assault frigate projectiles sending this corvette tumbling around. The projectile and the ship are both objects with a position in 3D space. They have their own mass and speed, and therefore, momentum. You can transfer it with impacts. So it was a very robust simulation in Homeworld. It was so robust that you could even use ships themselves as weapons due to their mass and speed. You could weaponize ship momentum itself to ram and even kamikaze other ships, bigger or smaller. In fact, there was a mission in the middle of the game where you would be shocked to notice the actual mothership of a fanatical bloodthirsty alien race deliberately and desperately ramming your destroyers, destroyers at that point being the pride of your entire fleet. It picks a ship and it orients itself and it brutally rams damaging itself in the process. It's ruthless and it's effective and you can do it too. In fact, you might notice yourself engaging in the same desperation later in the campaign after that. Please, please, please don't get rammed. Oh, you're gonna get so rammed, aren't you? No! Fuck. The sphere formation is best for this, but still, you can't avoid mistakes by... You can even kamikaze your fighters into the assault frigates that would otherwise counter and otherwise quickly destroy them. So the ships and projectiles all have mass and speed. Just look at this frigate being nudged by a kamikaze from a much smaller resource collector. You could use this to knock enemy iron cannon frigates off of their target. The possibilities are endless. 
And this is only possible because the game is an actual physics simulation and not a spreadsheet. It's amazing that the first ever 3D real-time tactics game could get everything right 20 years ago, while games now can so reliably get everything wrong. Speaking of which, these aspects were lost with Homeworld 2, where an engine change made no conscious effort to retain these aspects. I'll let Bob Amelius' video explain again. Homeworld 1's engine used a physics model to represent ships and weapons in space. Projectiles were actual objects flying around hitting things, and ships could miss moving targets that suddenly change their velocity, and Strikecraft could jink around in order to dodge incoming fire if you wanted them to. Contrast this with Homeworld 2's engine, which dispensed of that system entirely in favor of an RNG system in which a ship would target something with a weapon and the game would basically roll a die in the background to determine if that weapon hit the target or not. Homeworld 2 tended to have a lot more ships on screen at the same time compared to the first game, so the RNG system was likely adopted in order to save the CPU load that would be required to do the full physics simulation from Homeworld 1 on all those ships. Since Gearbox decided to create a common multiplayer environment between Homeworld 1 and Homeworld 2, one of these games pretty much had to be ported into the other one's engine because of the fundamental difference in how they function. So basically, for the sake of having a cross-game multiplayer, we lost these fundamental aspects of the Homeworld 1 experience. Because of the way weapon accuracy is handled in Homeworld Remastered, we have absurd scenarios like capitals being unable to hit stationary strike craft, because they're capitals firing on a strike craft, then the system says that capitals have a low chance of hitting a strike craft. Guess what happens in classic homeworld when a stationary ship gets targeted? It gets hit. Every. Time. This ballistic model ties into formations and tactics in a really cool way. You have to make a strategic decision of how you want your ships to behave in combat, balancing offensive potential and survivability depending on the enemy fleet's composition, what they're targeting, and if you have them outmaneuvered. And here's a quick examination of one of my videos from shortly after launch. Look at these observations here. You can actually see here that a projectile follows, or anticipates, a fighter that evaded the shot perfectly. What happened? Does the projectile bend and follow the craft? If perfectly timed evasive maneuvers don't evade projectiles, then something is seriously wrong. And then look at this one. You can actually see the ship explode before the projectile has had time to reach it, confirming the complete separation. Something is horribly wrong. And the Homeworld Remaster used the Homeworld 2 engine, so the remastered version of Homeworld 1 didn't have the same rich simulation-derived gameplay as the original game. There was a lot of complaining from a lot of the old fans of the series and a lot of patching happened and they fixed it. They fixed it. Not only did they fix it for the Homeworld 1 remaster, but they fixed it for the Homeworld 2 remaster too. So for the first time ever, we had Homeworld 2 with Homeworld 1 physics and ballistics. It gets even better. When Homeworld 3 was announced, they posted this. So they realised how important this simulation aspect is and fixed their game and promised to have the upcoming next game get this right in the first place. All because the diehard fans of the original game complained hard enough about a bad direction. The diehard fans of the original game complained and the developers listened to them. And now the next game in the series is going to be way, way better than it would have otherwise been. The fans of the franchise that stuck around since the first game, stuck around for 20 years, have ostensibly saved this franchise. If I had to sum all this up, it would be to say that the Wedge of Shogun 2 is a true formation ability and all of the benefits from it follows from the player's ability to use tactical gameplay to meaningfully avail of its unique properties. On the other hand, the Wedge of Three Kingdoms is a pseudo-formation. The physical arrangement of the men under the unit is entirely aesthetic and may even hinder the effectiveness of the unit in that regard. 
the reason to use Wedge on 3k therefore has nothing to do with actual battlefield and tactical considerations. It's entirely down to these numbers here and how they affect the events of the game because they're what you're playing for. The game is number driven and the numbers don't necessarily correlate or correspond well to tactics or gameplay in a real time tactics game. Clicking a button to get a guaranteed and substantial benefit, often with little to no drawback and always with no actual thought required, is not very good gameplay. What we have now, instead of immersive and tactical and careful gameplay with Wedge and with Tesudo and with guns and I'm sure plenty of other aspects that I'm yet to even think about in depth, is a complete forfeiture of the simulation driven approach to these games and the loss of all gameplay involving them as a result. We have a spreadsheet substitute where the gameplay is just number chasing. 25% here, 10% there, minus 50% there, Skinner box compulsion looping. If you told me in 2004 that this was the direction that Total War games would eventually take, with all of the possibilities that modern hardware and many years of additional knowledge would afford, I'd have been pretty depressed. I think we should want more than this, and that this kind of spreadsheet gameplay is a dead end for Total War, and a dead end for games as merited gameplay simulations on the whole. If this is the direction RTT and RTS is going down, then it's no wonder the genre is in trouble. And if you ever wondered why people say Rome 2 having no mass or collision or physics was such a big problem, hopefully now you'll never have to wonder about that again. It's not just a throwaway complaint, it's because all tactics and gameplay that involve unit mass and pushing and momentum and space will necessarily be terrible. And when you're playing as Rome and using heavy Roman infantry, that means all of it. All of the tactics and gameplay. All of it. Even in 2021, this is still what we have after 20 patches. Hunters there. It's, a, it's such a clunky, jilted fucking fight. <laughs> oh man. And I hate these pop-ups too. It's the thing, I don't even know how you would turn that crap off. I don't even know how you would. How is this still going? Holy fuck! Four units around you and you're standing there fucking fighting? What the fuck? Come on, envelop them! Fuck me, man. Oh, ugly fights. Ugly ass fucking fights. Alright, down to the Principes here. How are they still fucking alive? Fucking shit. What is all this shit in the middle still fighting after all this time? You can load up a custom battle and do this yourself right now. It's still like this because the core of the game is bad. Rome 2 is a piece of shit. Here's what the game looked like one year after launch and after about 13 patches. Are you looking at your left flank? Yeah, Are you yeah. If you're fighting? Yeah, I know. I've not done anything, I've just been watching this entire time. Is this worse than launch? Look at that! It's worse. It's worse. Look! Oh my god, the middle! Nothing is happening! Jo Jonas! Jonas Nee, fucking tell me you're seeing this. It's, it's like I've paused. There's nothing happening. It's like we've paused. Are you looking at this? Yeah. I'm tell me at you're looking. Tell me you're. There's literally, literally nothing happening. I'm not even exaggerating. There's literally nothing. I know. I'm seeing it. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. The one's fighting. <laughs> literally nothing. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you? Are you fucking joking? What the fuck? I cannot believe it. Like, I didn't think it was as bad. I thought they sort of made it passable now. How the fuck? I'm just, I can't, I'm just... <laughs> and I'm not even gonna bother wasting my time trying to think of gameplay that can accurately represent a launch day Rome 2. There's no point.
what I can do though is show you what it was like before launch. That there was the infamous Carthage trailer of Rome 2. As you can see, nothing ever changed. Delates are written. Look at that blob, holy crap. Looks absolutely ridiculous. Tri Triarii can take over. Stercus non potest poliri. And here's Rome from 2004, the first 3D Total War game. The difference is absolutely night and day. One is a simulation with emergent tactics and infinite possibility. The other is weirdly alien. A fucking goddamn mess. And now look at how modern Total War simulates a looser formation being more susceptible to cavalry. Three Kingdoms of 2019. Is this how it's going to be from now on? Have we completely given up? Why even make them spread out like that? Just click a button called Archers are nearby but cavalry isn't and be done with it. Let's just go back to text based roguelikes. Fuck it. All Total War games that retain this bad core and bad attitude will be bad and until I see any indication of a change in direction away from this I don't think I'm gonna be able to care much about any of them. Let me know what you think. If you can think of any other spreadsheetified gameplay elements, comment about them and let me know. If you have ways that this spreadsheetifying has actually precluded your attempted gameplay, I'd especially like to know. But that's it for this video. And if you've got an aspect of the gameplay that you'd like to see covered with this critique series, Leave a comment and I'll consider it. And, oh man, looks like I just made a 40 minute video that did nothing but talk about the aesthetics and feeling of the wedge formation. For people that want to support me, I have a Patreon. That's the best way to do it. Special thanks to Matteo Olivetti, Nerdington, The Rode 451, Halcyon, and Robert Sparks.